How's that? Yeah. Oh, it's right close to the edge. Uh, I think Yvonne is going to uh, calm it down a little. Testing, testing, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, testing. Is that okay? Okay. No, no, sounds good. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Um, vote for Bob. Um, you may know that there's an election going on in the UK. Well, a campaign, anyway. And um, one hopes, of course, that none of them get returned because then we have a government we like. Um, in case you actually are worrying who Bob is, um, here's Bob. No, that's not Bob. Here's Bob. Um, it's an active campaign to get um, politicians to commit to nature and not bulldozing over nature and building um, houses that nobody can afford, which is, of course, what the politicians' friends want to do. Um, red squirrel. Notice it's a red squirrel. And it's um, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. I'll just leave that one open. <laughs> okay, so Jeep Mars remoting. Here. Yeah, this is a sales pitch, uh, except it can't be a sales pitch because you're not going to pay me any money. <laughs> Damn. Um, it's breaking news, um, except that it isn't because I've done a version of this talk at the London Jar Community Unconference last November and also the uh, Grooving Grouse Exchange. <laughs> How many people are at either of those? Okay, so for the rest of it, it's breaking news. <laughs> um, it's new. Um, ah, sadly, no, it's not new either because it was done last July, so it's no longer new. Um, it's improved. Yes, yes, it's improved. <laughs> we have some improvement. Um, and of course, we all know what it is. It's um, GPARS, or at least a bit of it. So, thanks to um, GSOC, uh, Google Summer of Code, um, last year, I believe it's pronounced Rafał Swabik. Um, my Polish is a tens to zero rapidly. <laughs> Told us how to pronounce. And I'm not going to work out how to pronounce Alex's name. Um, Alex Chapman, something of that sort. Uh, apologies to him if I've got it completely wrong. He originally did a little bit of a, an implementation back a few years ago and it was left fallow. And why was it left fallow? Remote objects. We left it fallow because we focused strongly on getting single JVM to work. And so what, uh, going back a slide, what Raphael has uh, done is to take Alex's work and bring it right up to date. <clears throat> so we've um, got a lot of single JVM concurrency in parallels now there, and I suspect one or two people might be using it. Uh, more about five or six. So hopefully the sales pitch is going to make the rest of you want to go out there and use this stuff. And it's not restricted to Groovy, although you need Groovy to run GPARs, you can run the whole thing from Java code, but you will need the Groovy artifact on the path to do so. So what we've got now is an extension of the whole Groovy idea from single JVM to multiple. JVM around the place. And so we're using Netty as the transport layer between the JVMs, and it provides really quite a lot of that that's needed. What Raphael, based on Alex's work, has done is to provide that next layer above. 
So what are the things we're talking about? Um, are these concepts uh, familiar to people, sort of actors, data flow, CSP, data parallelism, most people are looking fairly blank, uh, which seems reasonable. You've probably come across uh, actors. Um, anybody who's done any Scala will have been playing with actors. And the idea there is that you send it messages. It does something. It sends a result back. It's not quite a function, but it's all good stuff. I'm going to have to change glasses. I just can't see the board here. Actually, data parallelism is one that people are probably well familiar with. Um, map, any day in parallel, that's all good stuff. So uh, we like that. You may have come across active objects, agents. Well, they're really just actors in disguise. So it's a different way of presenting the actor concept. Fork join, software transaction memory, also available in GPARMS. But to be honest, you want to really consider these things to be infrastructure. Yes. Software transaction memory has got touted by Haskell and Clojure as ways of doing concurrency and parallelism. I, I think personally they're a level too low for general usage. So the things on this page I think we're going to um, not deal with today, but they are there. So there's flags for these extra things that are going to be available. What I want to just quickly look at is this actors data flow really. I'm going to leave CSP and data parallelism for another day. But just in passing, I just want to mention why I want to leave data parallelism. This diagram tries to represent what we're doing with data parallelism. We have some collection of data, and for us in our program, in a single step, we transform all of those items. Now, if you use map or uh, what are they calling it in Groovy? Um, oh, collect on the grounds that <laughs> map. Uh, well, anyway, it actually comes from small talk. Uh, so small collect is the name used in small talk, and that's the name that then got used in 2003. Uh, never mind. I think you get the idea. We want everything to happen at the same time. If you use a sequential map, it sort of does, but you're going to do these things one element at a time on your processor. If we're doing this in parallel, then if we have enough processors, you do this one on one processor, this on another processor, this on another processor, so on and so forth. So that's the idea of parallel map. Data parallelism is another label for exactly that same thing. Now, would it be a good idea to do those on one JVM? these on another JVM? Maybe, maybe not. That's why we want to leave that one for a later date. We've got a lot of ideas to be thought about with trying to synchronize all of the data. So we're leaving that one as a single JVM operation where we know we don't have any issues. Data flow. Uh, how many people are actually aware of how you do things in data flow style? Not a lot. Okay, well, in which case I'll gloss over this a little bit for now and yet another sales pitch. I'm doing a workshop tomorrow um, on exactly this sort of stuff for people who don't know about data flow to find out about data flow and how it's different from the usual imperative and functional approaches to things. The TLDR, if you like,
like is that you're going to get inputs. So there's going to be a stream of inputs. And all of these green boxes are operators sitting there waiting for stuff to happen. There's no actual computing going on. With the arrival of data, this operator will do something and it will put data out on the output stream. And then it will go quiescent again, or stop. So each operator is an event-driven system in itself. And generally they're sequential. If you are not sequential, you're not doing it right. So each operator, sequential activity, triggers on data in, does something on data out, over after it's given the data out. enough of the waffle. We want code. No, nobody was saying not it. Oh, right. Well, you're going to get some code anyway. <laughs> How's the font size? Okay-ish? Need it bigger? No opinion was shown. So need it bigger. Apologies 
to that one and that and then get some nice size on there. So again we can just play with these data flow variables. A variable that only takes a value when it's sent it and then delivers it on demand. We're really just showing the use of create again. If the server still needs to talk to the infrastructure. And we're going to do everything on port 65535, create the infrastructure, and now set up the fact that we're going to serve. So Netty now generates a server on port 65535, and we are listening for requests. arriving 
So data arrived at the green blob and something then happened. Here, the green blob is just sick waiting for data. But it's arriving from somewhere else, you don't know. There's no fixed coordinate, there's no fixed communication system with actors. So it might be that this actor over here sends a message to this one. And this actor over here might send a message to that one. If you know the address of the actor, you can send it a message. Now there are many actor systems on the JVM. GPass has one. People possibly have been playing with them. But what happens if we put this actor on one processor, one JVM, and this one on a different JVM? Same abstraction actors, but a different way of working. Instead of being in the simply pipe uh, queues on the same JVM, we've now got to have some form of interprocess communication. We're doing it over netting. So um, let's play ping pong. We like to keep this example simple, straightforward. So let's play ping pong with actors. So we've got here a, a ball representing a ping pong ball, and it's just got a little bit of data that it carries with it, uh, some identifier so that we can. To check one ping pong ball from another ping pong ball. And I'm assuming that uh, in this game we've got 100,000 different balls. And, and each ball keeps a, a count of how many times it's been hit. It's just for fun. We don't go around persecuting ping pong balls. So a player is going to be an actor, so they're all going to handle themselves independently and we've got some idea or other and standard sort of initialization. The serializable is because we're dealing with Netty and all of these things need to be serializable to be moved around from JVM to JVM. Now the class we've got here. Another serializable thing. But basically, to do with players and rules and so on. <coughs> Why are we doing this? It's case classes. Anyone who was in the Scarlet talk earlier, case classes, really cool things whenever you're doing anything to do with actors. Because the type of the message can be an integral part of the message itself. And then you can use case classes to switch within the actor on what to do. We'll see an example of that in a minute. So a lot of these classes are here simply to make the code easier in the decision making. So what's the table going to do?
same way of working single JVM as multiple JVMs, as far as the program is concerned. And so the table expects the first player to turn up. Okay, so the type of the message is an important fact in processing this message. Any other type will just block. I'm not saying you can't get deadlock, and indeed live lock. What I'm saying here is that you will know very quickly, and you will know exactly where to go. And that's the big difference over the standard model of shared memory multi-threading, is you get deadlock, you haven't got a clue where it is for a start. With these ways of working, you know exactly where the points of synchronization are. You know where to go and look if ever you get deadlock. We expect a second player to turn up. Ping pong is pretty useless as an individual game, so we actually need two players to play with each other. And then once the two players are set up, we expect players to pass ball to us. So we've wrapped a ball as a player ball in order to be able to uh, process it quickly. I've shown this code very quickly. If people want to have a look at this code, then it's all going to be on GitHub. Um, it's currently on my server at home, but because of the lack of um, internet at the hotel and the lack of internet this morning, I failed to actually get the stuff up on GitHub. But we'll be able to download it from my server anyway, because it definitely is there. So I've just given a service skim over this so people can go and have a look at it later if you want. Having had a quick intro, you should be able to then get into the code quite quickly. We should demo this. So if I go back down to this one, so I need to uh, terminate that server. Uh, we need to terminate this little beast, that little beast. actors, and we should be in the right place. So let's get the table moving. Last we uh, notice the table sets itself up. You don't need people to actually do it. It's rather good. So this one will go to player one. So player one turns up to the game. Okay, so player one's turned up. And so let's have player two turn up. Oh dear, this rally's going to get really boring. <laughs> These guys are just too good. Uh, that's, that's, no, no, okay, I've had enough. Turn the telly off.
Um, there's actually an elephant in the room. And um, no, that's the wrong elephant. Uh, this is the elephant. And that elephant, for those who aren't into logos, is Hadoop. If, if Hadoop, why do you need anything else? Um, and the answer is because Hadoop is going. Uh, everybody's now switching to the Spark. Uh, what was that? Failed to download the Kotlin plugin. Uh, and we failed to have any way of getting. Ah, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so. Uh, now what's going on? Excuse me, I think IntelliJ is playing silly beggars. You like input output. 
me, I, if the computer's not flat out, I'm really not interested. I.O. is what you do at the beginning and at the end. And melting processes is what you do in the middle. And this idea of non-uniform memory architecture is an integral part of all that these days, with cores, multi-cores, multiple processors, and clusters. But there's an analogy now for what we do, because we're entering the realms of clustering. We're putting JVNs together in a small network. And so the analogy here is that we've got local and remote into a diagrammatic form. This one is for data flow, but you can do exactly the same with an actor diagram. Each of these boundaries represents a particular JVM. You can have data flow operators or actors within a JVM, and you can have multiple JVMs. So communications cost is what it's all about. When it comes to design of these systems, this is expensive. This is cheap. And so that becomes your design principle when you're looking at these sorts of things. OK, so that was the sort of corporate sales pitch. We've got a few minutes. I think what we should do is a little fun game. Um, has anybody got a computer that works on the network? Um, I, I finally managed to get one. Uh, it's, it's down here. And the interesting information, uh, see the font size is just not big enough, is that um, I am 138 0.4.167.127. So we now know you, you, you're going to bombard me, aren't you? Ah, uh, rats. I will lift my firewall. <gasps> Dangerous. Uh, so sudo firehall stop.
hit the right key. Now sadly, because I'm running both of these on one machine, um, you can't tell one from the other. If, if people had been hitting my machine, ah, brilliant, 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 brilliant. The homework for you is to find out why that happens. It shouldn't. And I haven't a clue why at this time. So there you are. Um, I'm going to end or bring this session to an end on failure. Because the sales pitch is you know, your GPAS needs you. Uh, in the same way that Groovy needs you, GPAS needs you because we haven't got any funding for anybody to do any work. So we're reliant on volunteer work. And I shall be putting this up onto the. Uh, where did we have no idea where our gyro is going. So if anybody knows how to move gyros from Code House to um, Atlassian, we need your help like two weeks ago. <laughs> so next week would be great. So just to uh, round this little session off,
you can connect into that. So it's, it's a, a form of polymorphism of the right sort. Okay, so let me leave that one there for now. If you want to talk a bit more about it, we can chat over a bunch. Um, any other thoughts, comments, questions, tomatoes being thrown are not allowed? Uh, the question here is can we distribute the code from service to clients? You can ship anything that's serializable. And so the usual rules apply that anything that's sent down the line, you have to be able to reconstruct at the other end. So the other end must already have the code, the classes, to be able to then reconstruct the message from serialization. And that's why I was using the serialization in the playable and the ball type. So it's marking them that they have to be serializable. You have to know about the class at the other end. But otherwise, anything can be sent down the line. <coughs> so I'll pause that one for a moment because I'm spotting another question over there which I think may be related. Yes, I could be. Uh, so the code that has to be sent across the wire has to be serializable. I guess that you're using, well, the system is using uh, the Java serialization. The question is, can this be changed to something else, for example, Cryo, which is way faster than Java Serialization? So the, the comment being made here is, can we change this from Java Serialization to a different form of Serialization? And the answer is, whatever Netty does at the moment. So we are sitting over Netty and assuming that whatever it can do, so the answer is I don't know at the moment. We have to try and experiment and see what happens. Okay, well I think we've reached lunchtime. Um, gurgling is probably happening in the regions between there and there. So at this point I'll thank you for, for listening and laughing at the right moments, which was great. <laughs> uh, and um, vote for Paul. <laughs> thank you very much.